You're welcome to First Take on 3FM and TV3. My name is Jifa Bampo. Today we are in conversation with the Minister for Education, Dr. Yao Osei Iduchum. Thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on being elevated from Deputy Education mm -hmm. Minister to Minister of Education. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So you came to the education scene with um, quite a lot of energy, quite a lot of bang. How will you assess the last four years before this current uh, elevation? I don't know about the bang, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, the energy, I can agree. Uh, but I, I just want to, first of all, thank God for this opportunity and thank the president for the confidence in me and to put me in this unique situation uh, to be able to spearhead the attainment of his vision for education transformation in Ghana. Uh, four years was great. It was an exciting time for me. Was I was busy? Very busy schedule. Um, visiting classrooms unannounced and teaching some classes. It was exciting. Let's talk about education, which is really what you've been doing for many years mm. outside the country mm. and now in the country. Mm. Mm. According to Ministry of Finance data, 20% of mm. our budget mm. uh, is spent on education. Mm. Um, for some analysts, education, finance, health, those are really challenging um, ministries, mm. tough to navigate. Do you feel that way, seeing as you are on a transformational agenda for education in Ghana? see the education administration tough to navigate uh, once upon a time i was working in a country called the united states of america building schools there as a ghanaian black african in america helping change education system in the city of los angeles and i always describe that as experience at swim, as swimming upstream now i am in ghana the president is in full support of education transformation. I'm swimming downstream. All that I have to do is to navigate very well, bring all stakeholders along, get people to understand that the nexus between education and economic transformation should be navigated carefully. Education should not be seen as an end in itself, but a means to an end, not just for individuals, but for the total transformation of the country. But when you sit in this seat, what we are looking at is how can the totality of Ghanaians get an education system that would then help us transform our fortunes. In talking about the challenge therein, certainly everyone has now been operating in an era uh, plagued by COVID. COVID. Um, the last time I spoke to the Ghana Revenue Authority, um, a commissioner about revenue mobilization in an era of COVID. How challenging has it been ensuring that there's education in an era of COVID? For one year, children didn't go to school. It's tough. Um, seeing classrooms empty. You know, education and COVID-19 are strange bad fellows. They have to coexist and it's not easy. But I think the president have really provided the resources to manage this well. We're talking about PPEs, we're talking about training for teachers and all the things that had to be done so that we will know how to handle COVID-19 and the TV programming, radio, the online, education. the online education. We may not have done the last mile approach in terms of how do I get this to a village exactly where you the cannot point even I wanted get to come TV to. signals. Very challenging one. But how, how have you dealt with that then? Under this circumstance, one of the things that we are now going to de uh, deploy more is called the iBox. iBox is developed in such a way that it can transmit Wi-Fi, local Wi-Fi, and allow people to access it. So more is going to be done. We already had them. Uh, so if you go to the last mile, the place where there's no internet connectivity, if you have an iBox, the content on it can be assessed. Who is pro providing the iBox? The um, Ministry of Education. Ministry of Education. Okay. You see, it was sponsored by the World Bank through the Secondary Education Improvement Project. And now they're doing more of them. I, I'm not sure of the distribution, but I know we're getting more for senior high schools and it will transmit even to the communities around. Very interesting device made in Ghana. And it's something that we need to 
be supporting more. But I think COVID-19 has taught us many lessons. Many lessons in terms of the digital divide, the gap between those who have access to technology and, the, and those who don't. And that gap in society then find expression in education. So in society, those who have access then get access to quality content. YouTube has lessons everywhere. Uh, Khan Academy, free resource. Students can use it. But if you don't have connectivity, not only are you boxed out of that, but you also box out of other opportunities that others with connectivity um, uh, can get. So as a nation, we are making progress. But when it comes to education, we need to accelerate it in such a way that the digital divide that exists in society does not then translate into academic divide uh, between students and among students, depending upon which uh, kind of home they come from. So I think it's something that has made us reflect on the digital divide and the consequences for us as a nation. The Ministry of Education in dealing with COVID and with the phased approach that allows students to return to school meant that you provided PPEs, Veronica buckets, cleaning agents and the like. But we've still had a, a high number of infections in school. Is that something, how are you dealing with that going forward as we know that some of the students will be returning to school as no, well I, soon? I will not belittle any infection because infection is an infection for the person who is affected, even if it's one and he's the one affected, it's an infection. So I can't sit here and say, no, uh, we shouldn't worry. But in fact, the rate is so low among the student population as compared to the adults. And research around the world shows that for some very good reasons, children are even more resistant than those of us who are adults. Um, the last week, there were 13 uh, infections. And the week before that, the number has kept dropping. Uh, this week, I haven't checked it. I'll be briefed today. I, we get briefings from Minister of Health. I'll get a briefing uh, this afternoon, and I'll be able to know uh, what our numbers are. But relatively, compared to the general population, our children have done very, very well. And I think we need to commend the parents and the teachers uh, for truly supporting the process and ensuring that um, the, ch the rate among children in terms of infection has been comparably, uh, comparatively much better than even expected. Our Ghana education sector has always faced lots of challenges. Mm -hmm. Access to um, education for all, mm -hmm. quality teaching infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, products that will come out of this mm -hmm. system that will mm -hmm. compete mm -hmm. locally and internationally. Mm -hmm. What for you is our greatest challenge? Is it the uh, digital divide? Is it the accessibility of uh, technology? Is it a lack of uh, STEM education? You want to have education system that produce critical thinkers. Children who will think. Think outside the box. Problem uh, solvers. Problem solvers. Excellent. But you have to go and look at your testing regime. Your books may be fine. Your curriculum may be great. But go and look at the testing regime to see the items on the test. If the items of the test are mainly testing knowledge and understanding, and it's about why did this happen, when did this happen, you are not going to create a critical thinkers. So, so, the, so the biggest challenge for you that we're facing is about um, producing critical thinkers and problem solvers. That's our biggest challenge yes, in education. Yes, so you have to then look at the architecture, the system that will produce that. And then that is when you look at your reform. People talk about STEM education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics education. Um, and I saw a question about, uh, some even talk about, oh, people become engineers and they don't work they, in They the don't work in their field. Well, we've done yeah, yeah. yes. so, so you see, the thing is this. It's not so much about working in their field, but it's about producing critical thinkers. I'm not an engineer, but I love engineers. I advocate for engineers because they are problem solvers. You cannot go through engineering by memorizing. You're going to create something. You're going to think about solutions. And, and, and I've seen engineers in this country who are in politics and they do so well. The analytics is excellent because engineering teaches you to think in a certain way.
So the same thing applies to STEM. So you can have STEM practitioners in any space, banking, media, everywhere. And you're going to realize that the output is different because they've been trained to work in a certain way. And consequently, when you do STEM, that is what you're looking at. The kind of output that is coming out are going to be those critical thinkers that we need for transformation. But the question is, are we producing the critical thinkers and the problem solvers that you say that we need, or that is our biggest challenge, because the educational system has reformed. I'm a parent too, and in a sense, some of us are confused about what is happening, mm -hmm. uh, what mm -hmm. will change. I have a mm -hmm. child in JHS mm -hmm. 1. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if she's writing an exam in mm -hmm. JHS 2 or JHS mm -hmm. 3. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. will we get out of this new system mm -hmm. then? You know, I talk about the system architecture and, and saying that it's building a system that responds to the needs of the individual child in the country. I want a child who is empowered and is assertive. I don't want a child who sits in class and will not ask a question because the environment is such that they cannot ask a question. I visit schools, talk to students, and I tell you, when I finish and ask them, who has a question for me, no hand will go up. I have to prod them. That is not the kind of education system that we want to create. So if you look at the new curriculum, the new curriculum is addressing that. It's becoming student-centered, where students have to participate in discussions in the classroom. Now, one critical component that you need to know as a parent is that we also have not assessed our students frequently enough to know whether they are doing well or not doing well. In other jurisdictions where education has really benefited their countries and transformed their countries, students are assessed at the national level frequently. Not, for them, not just for them to move on from junior high to high school, no but you assess them even within the primary school uh, in such a way that you know whether your students are doing well or not. And it's not going to be done. This year, uh, we are going to assess primary four students nationwide. And when we do that, we have critical data that enables me to know that my school in Cochrane, the primary four students are not doing well in literacy and mathematics. Then we've, we test them again in primary six. When we do the primary school exit exam, primary six, it's not for promotion because everybody's supposed to go to junior high. What is going to help us do is that those group of students who were tested in primary four, when they go to primary six, how far have they improved? So when all the national assessment regime is in place and we are testing primary two, primary four, primary six, junior high school two, and senior high school two, what is going to help us know as a country is that our students are progressing or if they are not progressing, you use the intervening years to do intervention. So when you assess primary two in primary three, when the results come, parents are going to get a copy of the results. It will break it down based on standards that they have masters and mastered, and the ones they haven't. That copy of the report will go to every single parent in this country. And then the form three becomes the intervention year, where you know that your child was not good at spelling. So you need to help that child to do well in spelling. Then primary four, he's going to be assessed again. Okay, so you've said assessments in class four, class six. Class two, four, six. Class two, four, six, mm -hmm. and JHS two. Yeah. And then they write the exam in JHS three, or how do they then move to no, senior high school? No, the JHS three exams will still be there. They will still the be nature there. of the exams may change, because you see, many years ago, there was a common entrance, it became BEC, which is subject area assessment. We haven't decided on that yet, but there will be assessment uh, at, JHS 3. Let me transition then to mm. the recent CSSPS uh -huh. uh, activities. I know mm. that the placements mm. have been done, but one of the key issues that emerged during this whole process mm. was it took quite a long time for some students to get placement, um, even after a month. I, I, I thought you were going to say that this year you didn't hear the noise. You remember, you were guys were there to capture what was going on. And this year, it has been so quiet. I thought you were going to compliment me. Yes, but I understand. But I get that. <laughs> but even it's not per se even about the noise. But this is um, commentary that has come from uh -huh. educationists themselves, some uh -huh. of the teachers, uh -huh. about we need a restructure of the CSS PS. What, what kind of system? No, so uh -huh. I wanted to ask you uh -huh. because one of the things that came up was a lot uh -huh. of 
schools were not um, subscribed to. Uh -huh. And this is part of the classifications that have been given. Uh -huh. How can we ensure that, you know, everyone gets a school and it's the school that they want then? Because I'm told, and there's no proof there's that people paid, paid oh. for change we, to be we made get, and we the like. We get that all the time, but the bottom line for me is this. We need to create more highly desirable schools. So what are we doing about that? As I speak with you, there are 10 schools under construction in Ghana. Um, if you go there and you look at the campuses, they are more beautiful than most of our existing schools. But it's not about the infrastructure. It's going to be about how those schools are operationalized. Operationalized as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics schools. And those schools will be second to nine in the world. And parents will love to see them. So we are now finishing up. Some schools will be done, um, completed by July. Um, most of them, the 10 will be completed by the end of the year. I uh, will to hire headmasters early on, get teachers trained ready for the children. The beauty of that is all the rules have been done. Beautiful architecture. So these but are schools that are going to be mainly for STEM education. STEM education mm -hmm. is going to be added to the top schools in the country in such a way that the rush, the pressure on the 54 will go down. So what I'm saying is that until we get more schools to become top performing from our middle tier and lower tier schools and then publicize it. Because you see, parents sometimes don't even know that St. James, a school in Sunyane, is the second best school in the country. But some yes. of the school rankings it may seem unfair. Achimota Why? School has what mm -hmm. uh, uh, almost four thousand students, and so, you are comparing so, their ranking mm -hmm. to a school that has maybe uh, eight hundred students, it's, it's and not, then Achimota School becomes it's, it's not, twenty something, thirty something, and this school with eight hundred students is number two. I don't think that's exactly accurate. No, so we inoculate our ranking system to kill the defect that you're talking about. We have what we call similar schools. Similar schools are the schools that have similar populations and get the same kind of students, the quality of the students. So when we are comparing with there are two comparisons. One is nationwide comparison, and Achimota will be compared with any other school. But when we go to the similar schools, Achimota is going to be in a league of its own compared to the 54 Ivy League schools. And within that contest, we are not even looking at just your regular test scores that came out. We are looking at the value that you added. So we look at the student that came to you, the average aggregate of students that came to your school. And what is the person aggregate on the WASI after they left? So when you do that, you can have a school that is somewhere in Fahiyakobo. Uh, and that school may be performing better because they added value to the students that came to them. So we have a system that will bring about fairness. Part of uh, the transition in terms of access to these schools is also infrastructure. I know that we've talked about the infrastructure debate for many, many years. Mm -hmm. in, the la in this year's budget, I think, the infrastructure projects under the education ministry amounted to some 1,119 projects. And I understand some 539 have been done. You still have uh, some 580 to go. How, in what, in what time frame do you hope to complete these? You see, there are three categories of infrastructure development going on in the country. We have e-blocks that are being completed. We have um, contractors working on a number of them. Then we have uh, school expansion uh, projects that was embarked upon under Nana Dankwe Kufuado, where we just went to schools and let's say KSTS in Kumase and added more facilities to it uh, so that we can then remove double track as soon as they get the infrastructure that they need. And then we have the new schools construction, uh, which most of the buildings are shaped like a V, so we call them V block. And that's uh, the 10 new schools that I'm saying that will be operationalized. Are you able year. to tell us which regions that some mm -hmm. of these V blocks oh, are located? Oh, Abomosu is in eastern region, Akrodie in Ahafu, uh, Pasempe in the northeast uh, region. Uh, that's Awasu is uh, one of them, I think northwest. Um, so, and then uh, they are, I think uh, there's another one uh, in central region. Um, there are 10 of them, okay. I can, in Ashanti region. Okay, so uh, that's fine. Uh, we have one in uh, Kwadasu. 
you mentioned the e-blocks. Uh -huh. um, how many have been completed? The last count, I heard you say 27 in Parliament. Yeah, um, 27 new ones were new. completed okay. to add to the 29 that we came to inherit that okay. were completed. And are we going to complete any more other we, than the there, 27? There are, there are contractors working on a number of them, so I can check and let you know which ones are nearing our completion. But at least there's still some work oh, no, ongoing work, work, there. Work is going on, except that a number of them we have to add burden. Otherwise, students won't go there. Mm. So in Saura, for example, in Northwest, two boarding facilities are currently under construction. Um, the school has opened, but the children are struggling, coming from long distances. And it's very difficult in rural communities to have a day, uh, a day school system. So in those cases, we are adding boarding facilities uh, so that students would then want to go there. Uh, to that school because they have bought them. Why build the e-blocks if you could convert some of the e-blocks to these um, STEM schools that you were looking well, for? You said why you build like the, at? You mean V blocks? V, you said no, different were, locations. Uh, they are in different locations. Other than where the e-blocks oh, are Oh yes, located. of course, of course. So they are not being built next to the e-blocks, no. Mm. They are in different locations in the country based on the needs that we saw and, and the geographical uh, location the existing schools were. So we are, we are working on all of them together. All right. But in terms of infrastructure, you mentioned that there are different categories, but do you have a certain time frame, say, is it by the end of term um, 2024, would these at least 580 and others be complete? I, I'm hoping uh, the existing ones that, uh, the ones that have been built in existing schools, uh, some of them may have even been completed by this time, because we keep getting handover uh, from uh, the contractors. So I'll update that data for you, but our hope is that within two years, probably we'll complete everything there in the existing schools. But the new schools will be done by the end of this year so that we can open next year. Okay. So, um, I know we are not talking in detail about free SHS, but mm -hmm. I understand that we've increased enrollment by some 43%. You can correct me if that mm -hmm. data is improved. And mm -hmm. we've seen um, 1.2 students having access mm -hmm. to free SHS. So can you, can you tell us mm -hmm. what the look ahead is in terms of projections mm -hmm. for how many students mm -hmm. do you hope to mm -hmm. benefit mm -hmm. from the free mm -hmm. SHS, whether mm -hmm. it's by end of term mm -hmm. or if it's an mm -hmm. annual year on year? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how much are we investing and mm. from where? Mm. From where? From you, the taxpayer. Paying taxes, natural resources, revenue is being used. And, and the whole idea is that if you do not improve your gross tertiary enrollment ratio, your nation doesn't get transformed. That is a 21st century precondition for transformation. So I always make a very simple example that if you go to Amasaman and the youth between the ages of 18 to 22, this Amasaman is a village, not the big Amasaman we're talking about. And the youth between the ages of 18 to 22 are 100. And you ask the village, how many people have gone to tertiary or are enrolled in tertiary? And they say 10. That town has 10% gross tertiary enrollment ratio. <clears throat> and you go to another village and say, oh, 18 to 22, 100, but 20 uh, people are in tertiary, irrespective of age. You also have a 20% gross tertiary enrollment ratio. Nations that have a high gross tertiary enrollment ratio sees rapid transformation from that point forward. Mauritius is 40% and it's moving. Egypt, 38%, upper middle income. Ghana, 18.8%. Yes, we are better than the African average of 7%. But we need to work hard and strive hard and move forward. Now, you can't talk about gross tertiary enrollment ratio when your secondary enrollment is not there. Uh, just a simple statistics. Uh, in 2016, three years of high school, the students that were enrolled in high school was about 850,000. Uh, now, as we speak, uh, we have about 1.25 close 1.26 million uh, students enrolled. So you see the difference, close to 400,000 students enrolled at any point in time is going to be that way for a number of years to come. That additional 400,000 that we have 
translates into a higher gross station enrollment ratio. It translates into a well-educated workforce for the country. And that is where the nexus between education and economic transformation then plays itself. So the bottom line is this. Investments are being made, but it's being made in the human capital of Ghana. It's not for individual benefit. That is why some people get into this. Why are we paying for these people? Paying for these people. They are our human capital base. So before you get into this argument, why are we paying for all these people? No. We are paying for into our future for transformation. So yes, 1.2 million, 0.26 million students. It's a huge undertaking. And uh, you can see that something different is happening under Anadu Dankwe Kufuado. And it is because there's a strong sense that if we don't provide education opportunity to the vast majority of our youth, our country will be sitting on a time bomb. You talked about a Ghana, you don't want uh, two Ghanas, a Ghana for the rich, a Ghana for the poor. There's still many people, well-educated people, who were educated in um, some of these uh, 54 schools that you mentioned, who are opting out of Ghana's education system. They may not be rich, but they are paying for international education. I'm talking about uh, Cambridge education being accessed in Ghana, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. IB education, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. all those other forms of education. Mm -hmm. And there's a market for it. So people mm -hmm. are charging mm -hmm. top dollar for mm -hmm. the old system mm -hmm. education that you and I I, I don't I want to overpromise you, but I'll tell you one thing. The public education system that you see today will never be the same two years from now. So don't write us out. It's going to happen in Accra, it's going to happen in Kumase. New schools are going to be built in such a way that will compete and will produce better outcomes than the private schools. I know how to get things done. The president's vision is clear. He wants us to bring about transformation. I will prosecute that agenda for the president. And this idea that somehow we have some international schools and they are better than us. We're going to compete. It's in not the same just way, that they are the, better than us, but I mean, it's about your, your, mm -hmm. your speech to Gimpa talked about being future fit, future yes. ready. Yes. And it seems that the path that some others, mm -hmm. they may not be able to afford it, mm -hmm. but they do find the money to pay for I that have, education. I have, good, I have good news for them that a time will come, they'll be sending their children back to our schools. That's the good news I have for them. Mm. But I can understand their frustration. I want my child to sit in a classroom that is well decorated. Not well I decorated, no, no, but, but they want. They, I think it's about the quality. You want your no, no, child me to meet no. their cousin who comes from abroad uh -huh. and be able to operate and, and engage let, let at me, that let, very let, high let level. Let me tell you, students from Wesley girls can engage and, and operate at a high level just like any student from anywhere in the world. I've built schools in America. And I know the kind of schools that are coming out in, students coming out in some of our schools. A student from Prese can compete with any school student anywhere in the world. But I'll tell you one thing. At basic schools, maybe the primary school, there's a parents who have a, an option and they say, okay, I'd rather do Cambridge. I don't fault them. But what I'm saying is that even for those levels, we are going to have schools that can compete with anybody. The, there was a major issue that happened just at the time you became minister mm. where a student of Rastafarian um, inclinations mm. was denied the registration process to mm. be in school. Mm. I'm just, I know this issue is before court, I know this issue is before court, so we don't want to be subjudicate. The two boys are not in school while the court processes proceed. Why could you not, as um, education minister, intervene directly? Case in court. No comment. Any final words for you, Dr. Edwin? Thank you for coming here and interviewing me in my office. And I want to thank uh, the media for their support during my first four years. And I hope I can count on their support during the next years ahead. But I want to tell you that whenever we get a criticism about the state of our schools, I take it seriously because I know we can do better. And we are going to do better. I've made my agencies aware that we are not accepting mediocrity. We have to ensure that the taxpayers of Ghana get value for money. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's been Dr. Edu Chum, uh, the Minister for Education, speaking to us on uh, First Take for 3FM and TV3. Thank you for joining us.